Morning. Thank you very much. While my presentation is being loaded up, I um, just want to say it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially back in Philly. I'm a Haverford College alum, so uh, spent some time in Philly just down the main line. Uh, and to give a little context, uh, I led the sustainability office when Mike was mayor, uh, worked with uh, Johanna and uh, Tom and others who are here today, uh, and currently lead the sustainability practice at an organization called Bloomberg Associates. I'm a principal there. We're a pro bono consulting firm that works with cities around the world 100% free uh, as part of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Our only mission is to improve the quality of life for citizens around the world. So at any given time, we're working with a, a dozen or a half dozen cities around the world to help their mayors uh, achieve their goals. But before I talk about cities, or before I talk about heat, I actually want to start talking about movies. Um, since the beginning of Hollywood, movies and directors have been fascinated and fixated on natural disasters. And, and we've seen all types of disaster movies. We've seen movies about, particularly the natural disasters, tornadoes. We've seen them about sea level rise. We've seen movies about you know, global catastrophic storms. We've seen movies about environmental collapse. We've seen movies about deep freezes. Uh, we've even seen movies fixated and, and featured around hard rain, as crazy as that may be and as unexciting as a topic it is. We've even seen movies about sharknadoes, what happens when tornadoes get covered with sharks. So Hollywood has a vast imagination that's trying to scare us to think about things, but they've actually missed the boat. The one natural disaster that hasn't gotten the Hollywood treatment is actually the one that's responsible for more deaths a year combined than all other natural disasters, and that's heat. And that's the one that really should be scared of the most. So heat kills, as I said, more people than all other weather-related disasters. Um, one only needs to look to Europe in 2007, a uh, 2003 heat wave, which killed 70,000 people during that summer heat wave, uh, to understand the potential impact and scope of heat. And we could just look to last month, or two months ago at this point, in July, where you saw for the first time hydration breaks incorporated into the Women's World Cup. 4,000 schools across France were closed in the month of July because of heat waves. Temperatures reached over 108 degrees in Paris. Dramatic impacts. And those weren't isolated just to Europe. July was actually the hottest month ever in human recorded history. Tremendous impacts across the world and in the US. Anchorage, Alaska saw 90 degree temperatures for the first time ever. Temperatures reached 100 degrees in San Francisco, 30 degrees over their average. Boston had more days over 90 degrees in July than they average in any other typical year. These are catastrophic major impacts that we're seeing that are happening across cities. And this summer is part of a larger trend that we're seeing. As, as global temperatures are rising, we've had four of the five hottest years on record since 2015. Um, since the 1960s, the average number of heat waves in the 50 largest U.S. cities has more than tripled. So this is not a extreme event that we're seeing that is not frequent, that we don't have to be prepared for, this is actually becoming the new norm. And if this trend continues, scientists project that in the next 60 years, Philadelphia will feel more like Memphis, Tennessee, that the average temperatures in Philadelphia will be six and a half degrees Fahrenheit hotter. And that has tremendous impacts for the infrastructure, for human health, and for the way we operate as a city. Now, we, we like to focus on climate change. But climate change is not the only culprit or reason why this is happening. And I think you're going to see some common threads in what we're talking about today, reintroducing nature into cities, uh, how we need to think about orienting cities differently around cars. So over the last century, I would argue that urban planning has turned our cities into ovens. Urban growth driven by the rise of cars has led to cities with dark, impermeable surfaces, parking lots, roadways, rooftops, and have decimated green space. Combined with cars and air conditioning, both of which exhaust heat into the atmosphere, this has led to the urban heat island effect, where cities can be 20 degrees hotter than the surrounding communities, particularly at night when people need to cool down. And to give you a sense of scale, I hail from New York, a city that's not thought of as car dependent, but we dedicate an enormous amount of our land area to vehicles. In New York, we dedicate 7 million square feet of land for parking, 77 million square feet for streets, 
Combined, that's the equivalent of more than 22 central parks that are just dedicated to cars. That has an enormous impact on every facet of our life. And we know that these impacts, even within cities, are not felt evenly. There have been a number of recent articles and maps, the Washington Post, New York Times, NPR is now running a great cities, looking at the uneven and, and uh, impacts of heat across cities, where you can see a 20 degree swing in temperatures just within a city. And that often correlates with income. It often correlates with vulnerable populations. In Philadelphia, you can see this as well in Hunting Park. And this is an enormous impact on public health and the impacts that it can have. And not just within cities, indoor temperature versus outdoor temperature. There was a study done in Harlem in New York that found that the average indoor temperature was seven degrees hotter than outside. Often vulnerable populations, low-income populations, don't have air conditioning. 80% of the heat-related deaths that occur in New York happen indoors. So this is an issue that we need to be addressing. The good news is, is we know that there are proven cost-effective solutions to try to address heat. And, and taking a page from Commissioner Farley, we want to talk about the solutions. And the good news is that these solutions actually have a lot of other positive benefits. They're going to look very similar to Johanna's slides. They're going to be very similar to things that you think about when you want an ideal city. We need to change our built environment and return to a people-centric, climate-responsive urban design uh, and also develop proactive health programs to protect people and vulnerable populations from the impact of heat. So I want to take you on a really quick tour of where I see some of those solutions happening and, and what they look like. Uh, what the solutions look like, shading our cities, providing people respites from the heat, creating more green spaces, lightening the surface colors in the city, and introducing water back into our urban environments. Very easy things to do, proven to do. In New York, as part of Plan YC under Mayor Bloomberg, we launched a million trees campaign. We actually finished that campaign three years early, planting one million trees throughout the city in just seven years. The city has continued that evolution, is now as a three-year, $100 million program to target trees in the hottest neighborhoods within the city as an effort to try to cool the city. And we're seeing this type of program being replicated in Nashville, in Paris, in Milan, in Melbourne, where they actually have a goal of planting 30,000 trees in the central business district as part of an effort to cool the city by four degrees. So very targeted. Stuttgart in Germany is actually trying to plant green quarters to bring cool air from surrounding hills. So creative ways of using trees and reintegrating it into the urban environment. Shade structures that could be introduced to enliven streetscapes, to draw people in. It's good for business. It's not just good for heat. Pedestrianizing areas. Introducing greenery where you don't have room on the streets into buildings. Chicago has been a pioneer of green roofs. Uh, in Paris and other cities where the rooftops may not be appropriate uh, or where they want to be used for other things or bringing greenery closer to people and to the sidewalks looking at green walls. London's been experimenting with bus stops. Where can you scram you know, greenery into every single inch of the city? Bosco Verticale is one of my favorite examples. Uh, over 800 trees incorporated into two buildings in Milan uh, Stefano Boeri, the architect, is now looking at doing this with affordable housing, so it's not just for luxury. How do you bring trees and integrate it into every facet of our urban environment? Melbourne has actually looked at their alleyways, and, and this is maybe uh, something for Philadelphia, which is famous for its alleys. Reintegrating greenery aggressively into them as a way of cooling the city and providing more recreation spaces. New York City, we converted 240 schoolyards into playgrounds. That provides recreation and more active spaces for children, open to the community in the evenings and weekends. Paris has taken this idea and converted it solely into an urban oasis program. How do you use schoolyards in the hottest neighborhoods to create urban oases to cool off in the summer for children and for vulnerable populations in evenings and weekends? They just completed their 29th schoolyard this summer as part of that program. Where you don't have things on the street, We've been focusing on cool roofs. This can cause 20 to 30 degrees cooler surface temperatures on rooftops, going from black rooftops to white rooftops. In New York, we coated over 6.7 million square feet of rooftops with cool roof materials. They're now targeting almost 3 million more square feet of rooftops in priority neighborhoods, just an effort to try to cool the city. But we need to take it to the streets as well. LA has been pioneering work to test different cool materials which can cool the surface temperature of streets by 10 degrees. 
as a way, as I mentioned, all the de space dedicated to streets in the city, if we can change the color of that, it can have a huge impact, particularly where people are walking, where pedestrians are experiencing it, cooling cities, and parking lots as well. One of the most exciting examples is happening in Tokyo now. As part of the Summer Olympics, to prepare for the heat that's going to be part of that, they're actually coding 136 kilometers of streets along the marathon route, along man, many of the venues and stadiums, uh, with cool materials to try to cool the pavement, cool the pedestrian experience, cool the experience for runners. And they're also integrating permeable material and water features, where they think combining with cool materials and water can really uh, dramatically cool the urban experience for athletes and for attendees. And introducing water features. We simply can't change the materials that we're using, providing shade. You saw the picture from Paris in the heat wave this summer. People flock to water. They want to cool off. How do we actually thoughtfully incorporate into parks, into public plazas, one of my favorite places in Philly, uh, splash pads and other temporary ways of giving people respite? One of the most exciting examples is a billion dollar project that was done in Seoul where they actually took down a, a major highway in the middle of the city as an effort to revitalize a neighborhood, to cool temperatures, to improve air quality, daylighted a river that had existed, providing now opportunities for people to come in and actually get close to the river. This has now seen more than 50 million visitors since it's open. So it's not just cooling the city, providing better air quality, but it's been a, a huge boon for tourism and a huge economic engine as well. But we know we can't simply design our way out of this problem. We need to think about the proactive health measures we need to bring to people to protect public health, again, particularly about uh, when it comes to vulnerable populations. New York, when it, temperatures get above 90 degrees, we open more than 500 cooling centers, free air-conditioned spaces that can be used by people to provide respite during the day. Now we're needing to rethink that in cities are in general because it's not just during the day that it matters. I mentioned that seven degree increase in indoor temperature and that cities can be 20 degrees hotter at night. Nighttime, and as we're seeing longer heat uh, waves that are lasting longer, we need to think about where are people going home at night? Are they going home to ovens? Are they able to stay cool at night? Athens is actually innovating and a number of European cities are creating apps that can direct people to not just cooling centers, but supermarkets, movie theaters, other places that have air conditioning can provide respites during the day. And what are the coolest walking routes they can get, shaded walking routes to get there? We need to think about pop-up interventions. We don't have enough money to simply rebuild parks. So where can we do, this is a dumpster pool that was incorporated into the Summer Streets program in New York City, pools that can be brought into different neighborhoods. Closing off streets, the Summer Streets program that we do every August and July in New York that opens up uh, large swaths of the city to pedestrians and bikers. Uh, fire hydrant caps, so people, we know that they open our fire hydrants. How can they do that in a safe way to provide cooling off opportunities for citizens? Providing more water for people and making sure that they can remain hydrated and free and not rely on sodas. We also know that for some people, air conditioning is a lifeline. In New York City, we provide free air conditioning to income qualified vulnerable populations. That is part of the necessary solution. We know that cannot be the only solution that we do. Currently, air conditioning and fans represent 10% of global electricity use. We expect that air conditioning is going to increase fourfold as the world gets hotter and incomes rise. That's an unhealthy and dangerous feedback loop. The hotter it gets, the more people use air conditioning, the more heat it exhausts into cities, the more energy it demands, the more climate change occurs and temperatures get hotter. How do we break that cycle but knowing that this is going to be part of the solution in targeted areas? And education and outreach. These are examples from Hunting Park in, in Philadelphia. We need to go out into communities. People don't understand the risks of heat. People think about summer heat waves as part of the natural cycle of life and what we deal with. It is getting extreme. It is getting dangerous. So we need to educate people. So, you know, we need to start thinking about and looking at Hollywood. Heat is coming, and we need to undo the damage we've done in our cities. Rather than looking at disaster movies to scare us into action, Hollywood can offer inspiring examples and a vision of what cities could look like with a people-centric, climate-responsive urban design. And we're starting to see that now where cities are not just the evil actor that needs to be overcome, 
but actually can be a positive vision for where we need to move. And we need to make these movies and these visions a reality. The World Health Organization predicts that heat-related, uh, heat stress-related related incidences and rising temperatures are going to be responsible for another 38,000 deaths a year in the next 10 to 30 years. We need to begin taking action now to bend the arc of our trajectory and redesign our cities. Thank you. Thank you.